What's the ugly? I mean, I've read, I've seen, I've interviewed, I've, I've, I've uh, done a lot, of, a lot of research on that. What was the ugliest part? Can I tell you who the biggest organized crime is in the entire world? Who? The government. Every government is the worst organized criminal enterprise on the face of the earth. These guys here, they're midgets compared to the government. Government is your biggest criminal organization on the face of the earth. There is no Jewish gangster anymore. So I, I really, I am the, the tail end because a Jewish, a real Jewish gangster on that level, they were also patriots, American patriots and Jewish patriots. It wasn't just the question of money. Meyer Lansky, for example, Longies Willman, um, they fought the American Nazi party. They cooperated with the United States government in operation on the world in World War II. And they supplied weapons and arms to Haganah and to Ergun to help create the state of Israel post World War II, uh, pre state uh, in Palestine, pre state Israel. That's the reason why I was involved deeply with Simon Wiesenthal, Wiesenthal um, so that I could do my share of. Um, let's say, participation as far as Jewish, uh, beyond, above and beyond. So it wasn't just a question that they were protecting the neighborhood or protecting the Jewish community and so forth. It went beyond that. There was a, a tremendous amount of patriotism that was not, people are going to watch this as, oh, kind of patriots. Eh? They were gangsters. They were this. There's a, a Talmudic, wisdom that says life is not either black and it's neither white. It's all shades of gray. Guys that, that were extremely, extremely close, that I was close with, was all the way upstairs on top. Jerry Katina from Newark uh, was my father's partner in the jukebox vending business. Doc Stature, Longies Wilman, Meyer Lansky. Those people I knew. Those were your, okay. So how was Meyer when you met him? What was Meyer like? A, a gem. He was, he was just a low Low key guy, all right. Um, dressed conservative, thought conservative, and he was a patriotic American and a patriotic Jew. Uh, very strong on the question of Jewish identity. In terms of theology, whether he believed in God, probably not. He it didn't. He wasn't a practicing Jew. He was a nationalistic Jew. All those guys participated in supply of weapons and arms at a time that the Neutrality Act was invoked by Truman, stating that it was a criminal act to supply weapons and arms to Palestine, either to the Arabs or to the Jews. Our guys played a significant role in buying up weapons and arms, uh, um, surplus weapons and arms post-World War II, and we had all the shipping connections at the port of New York through Frank Costello and Albert Anastasia so that the longshoremen cooperated with the Jews, with the Zionists, to ship weapons and arms. Meyer Lansky and Longies Wilman played significant roles. They went out of their way constantly. My father's partner, original partner, was Joseph Doc Stacher. Doc Stacher was, uh, he was a genius. Absolutely, what a what a mine. But Doc Stacher accepted exile from the United States in a deal that he worked out with Edward Bennett Williams, the great lawyer from Washington, and Robert Kennedy. He actually made the deal with Kennedy to accept exile from the United States. He was in Israel. He told me on one Saturday afternoon, it was Saturday morning, you'll be here for lunch, for Shabbat. And just, he never told me why. And all of a sudden, Meyer Lansky walked in. Meyer Lansky sat down next to me. Oh, they were, they were very polite, very cordial. And he tells me, listen, son, he says, they made me bigger than Al Capone. That's why I'm here in Israel. Because if I go to trial, uh, I'm going to do life. And all it was was just an um, uh, income tax case. At the end of the meal, they took me off to the corner and they were concerned at that particular point about Mr. Katina, who was my father's partner that bought 
how Doc Statcher, after Doc went to went to L.A., opened up the Moulin Rouge, and then he was at the at the Hotel Flamingo and Sands and so forth and so forth. They were concerned about Jerry Katina. Right? Years, it took me years later to figure out all of the concerns. It was all about the rake-off. Who's in charge of the rake-off? Because once Meyer Lansky left Florida to go to Israel, who was in charge of the of the uh, uh, the, the money if the, coming into? We used to go to Miami. Meyer would have it packaged up, and it would be picked up by a fellow by the name of Sylvain Fetterman from Geneva, Switzerland, who was, I think, somehow or another related to Tibor Rosenbaum, who was the owner of a bank called the International Bank de Credit, which was the bank that banked both the Rakoff for the mob and was a Mossad bank. It, 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 worked, it worked both for both the... Uh, for both organizations. I'm sure a lot of people are going to be watching this and say, I never knew all of this stuff. The Jews were that tough. We had as many shooters and maybe more than the Italians. So very different Jewish reputation then than it is today. Completely. Night and day. Completely. Feared, respected, money makers, racketeering, the original mobs. And it, it, it almost seems like when you study the history, they, they, they almost took in and they shared their secrets and they trade secrets with the Italian and the Irish. The Red Levine, all right? That was Meyer Lansky's favorite shooter. Now, my, or Sam uh, Red Levine what was a, a bit of a religious He was a bit of a religious Jew. Yeah. He wore a kippah, all right? Ate kosher and used to tell Meyer Lansky, don't give me an assignment on Shabbat unless it's absolutely necessary. He wouldn't kill anybody on Saturday unless it had to be taken care of. All right? We had thousands and thousands of professional prize fighters. And it, up until the middle of the 1930s, one third of the champions of the world were Jewish. If you don't mind educating myself on the audience on the history of the Jewish mob. Okay, I'll be glad to. So. <clears throat> The Jewish mob basically starts at the time of the large immigration from East Europe in the late 1880s, 1890s. And of course, poverty, they come into the United States, they move into the cities, and they form the ghettos of the United States, whether it's Baltimore, whether it's Boston, New York, Brooklyn, Detroit, Chicago, Cleveland. And um, these... Uh, uh, it, the original, the original Jewish gangster, was really. Um, it was brutal. It was. It was. He was a brute. It was brutal. There's a book that I read many, many years ago that said, twenty five percent of the prisoners in the New York prison system were Jews. What were the crimes? A lot of the crimes were violence. What, what year was this? Probably at the turn of the twentieth century. Got it. All right. And um, it was the, the name of the book was called The Rise and Fall of the Jewish Gangster. They were involved in, in, in all forms of, of shakedowns, violence, beatings, murders, and prostitution. Okay. All right. Um, the majority of the, of the prostitute in, in uh, that time were Jewish women. They'd come, they couldn't find their husbands, and the pimps would be waiting for them on the piers. Now, the generation that comes up that was either born in the United States or had recently immigrated from Europe, let's say, for example, Meyer Lansky, Benny Siegel, Lepke Bulkalter, my father's world, and so forth. Some of them were born here, and some were uh, born on the other side and came as young kids. All right? And I'm talking now post-1900. So these kids start as gangs. And what they want, it's control of territory and neighborhoods and so forth. And um, the control of the ghetto. They had a responsibility as well. And that was to protect the, the ghetto mm -hmm. from the uh, being invaded and beat up by kids from other ethnicities. There, there was a, a very, very well-known gangster from Newark. 
It's amazing. If I'll say to people, who's Abner Longy's Wilman? If you didn't come from Jersey, you never heard of him. He was on an equal level with Meyer Lansky, Benny Siegel. All right? He was six foot two, good looking guy, uh, waxed rich during the prohibition period, became known as the Al Capone of New Jersey. 75, 80% of the alcohol that came into Jersey came in under his rule. And he was one of the big financiers of the Hollywood movies. Uh, he had a love affair with Gene Harlow. He made a great success out of Gene Harlow. The, uh, the, uh, she was the, the Marilyn Monroe of her time. At the time of prohibition, because the law starts in 1920, you have um, uh, the old timers, one of them in particular, Arnold Rothstein. Arnold Rothstein was the brain. Now, the brain was allegedly the guy that uh, fixed the 1919 World Series together with a, an ex-Jewish prize fighter by the name of Abe Attell. This was White Sox against the Reds. They call it the Black Sox, Black Sox. or something like that. Yeah. Right, right. It was the Chicago Black Sox yep. scandal. So Arnold Rothstein, uh, he came from a, and he didn't come from the ghetto. He came from a middle class Jewish family, very well respected. And he himself wanted to be an outlaw. Um, He's the one that actually, in fact, is responsible for the modern day mob. Uh, he, he, he was the original um, money guy for bootlegging in New York. It meets, uh, it, we, we need young kids to, re to protect our convoys. So go to the gangs in the, in the ghettos. And if he spotted somebody with potential leadership, like Meyer Lansky or like Lucky Luciano, he schooled them and he showed them you're going to make more money with this than you're going to do with this. Stop being thugs. Now you've got an opportunity to make a lot of money through prohibition. Everybody wanted whiskey. Everybody wanted alcohol. So he becomes the father of modern, of the modern mob. The, the, the connection between the Jews and the Italians, the common interest was making money. Lucky Luciano had the, the brains to see that money could be made with the Jews. And Meyer Lansky understood we can make money with the Italians instead of knocking our brains out with each other. Let's do it. The, uh, over, the period, over the period of post-war, uh, World War II, uh, you had uh, competition. And it's very interesting. Good question. You had competition between um, Cubans. Well, they were the new boys on the block post Castro, post uh, Batista. So when the Cuban mob came here, it was formed. They called themselves La Cooperación. They went toe to toe with the Italians over the number holes and over the, the numbers business in New York to the extent that they were burning down each one's number holes. And then ultimately, there was a declaration that they sat down at a sit. Together, the boss of the Cubans was named Jose Miguel, Jose Miguel Batley. And he sat with Fat Tony and they worked out a peace agreement. See, this Jose Miguel Batley was a hero in the Bay of Pigs. He was one of the commanding officers of that unit 4863 or whatever that was, that was part of the invasion of Bay of Pigs. He was a CIA guy. So when he came back to the United States, uh, they were... The deal was negotiated so that uh, money and medicine went to Cuba to release the guys that were locked up, the prisoners on the Bay of Pigs. Jose Miguel comes back and forms what's known as La Corporación, the corporation, all right? Because I was the, the, um, the founding father of the gambling machine business. I brought back the slot machines from the time that LaGuardia knocked them out in 1941, eliminated Meyer Lansky and Frank Costello. I, in 1977, started to put out the first slot machines again. Um, I was a pioneer. I was the, the grandfather of it all, all right? But 
Everybody went into it. Italians, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans. I got what you're saying. Russians, okay. Israelis. Got it. I had three state cases and three federal cases. I was a revolutionary. Every time they locked me up, I was back the next day opening, doing business. Got it. I was just a defiant sort of a guy. And um, I did time. I um, The last case was a federal case. I had a federal case in Washington, D.C. You'll get a kick out of this one. The name of the judge was Harold Green. Harold Green was the guy that broke up the ATT monopoly, and he had the Iran-Contra affair. He was the judge in that. Wow. So he was my judge. I get locked up with an old-time mob guy by the name of Joe, the, Joe the Possum Nesline, right? for promoting slot machines. That Joe, the, Joe was uh, probably a little bit senile at the time. He introduced me to an undercover FBI agent. And I'm going all over Washington, D.C. and going to black locations. And, Come on, bro. You put my machine in. He said, OK, Pop, I'm going to argue with you. You look like you with the man. I said, well, of course I'm with the man. That's, you're putting machines. I'm going to put machines here, put machines there. Meantime, this FBI agent's all wired up. I get locked up. All right. Harold Green is the judge. And the prosecutor is a... Young Jewish woman, uh, I'm, I'm being real kind about it. She falls in love with me. All right? She's in, enchanted with me. And if she ain't going to screw me one way, she's going to screw me the other way. She says, you're the Meyer Lansky of our time. And you know what? I'm going to prosecute you. I'm going to get... Bu- 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 bu. So my my kid my cousin was my lawyer and he says to me we, we had a plea bargain there was no way i was going to win this particular case the fbi had me under uh, so um my kid cousin says to me get in touch with your friend simon wiesenthal the nazi hunter so i contact dr wiesenthal he says i'm in trouble he says what do you need i said I need a letter he said no problem he writes a letter to judge green and he says, this is the man that helps me pursue Nazi war criminals in South America. Right? He's my man. It's in my book, the letter that Wiesenthal writes to, uh, the judge. to Judge Green. Judge Green turns out that he is an escapee from Nazi Germany. He was a Kennedy Democratic Party wow. appointee. Interesting. Right? So he gets the letter from, from Simon Wiesenthal and... Calls this girl, I don't want to hurt her feelings or damage her terrible reputation any worse than it already is. And he says, lady, he says, um, what am I going to do with this letter? She says, the letter's false. So I, she, it's counterfeit. She says, go prove it. Anyways, to make a long story short, she runs back in. She spoke to somebody. She said, how do I know it was Simon Wiesenthal? The judge says, get the hell out of here. You called him or he called you. She says, no, I call, get out. It out. That letter's authentic. In Chicago, there was a very famous prize fighter, triple crown champion, hero at Guadalcanal by the name of Barney Ross. Very great American hero. In the time of the Nazis, uh, they beat up, they fought the anti-Semites, uh, the Jew haters in Chicago. One of the guys that, were, that fought together with Barney Ross was Jacob Rubenstein. Some people say, oh, who the hell was Jacob Rubenstein? So let me make it easy for you. Jack Ruby is a son of a bitch. Jack Ruby. He, yeah, he was, he was a, a Jewish hero. All right. Bit of a new crazy guy, but. Uh, he was a Jewish hero. Jack Ruby. He fought together with, the, with all the Jews to, to defend against anti-Semite. But Abe Sussman, the old friend of my dad's, told me that Jack Ruby was just a knockaround guy that ran a few strip clubs in Dallas, Texas. All right. But. He was close enough in the police. To, what police department has a, a schmegeggy like uh, uh, Jack Ruby hanging in his place with, with a pistol? It's John F. Kennedy assassination. I've heard a now I've interviewed 20 people on the topic of John F. K. You know, JFK assassination. What do you know? The involvement of Ruby, the mob, the CIA, LBJ. What do you know? So, so Jimmy Blue Eyes tells me this story. Okay. I used to meet with him once a, a month uh, downstairs in the Hilton Hotel. So I said to him one time, I said, Jimmy, 
this kid, uh, Harvey Oswald. He says, we have better fucking shooters than Lee Harvey Oswald. It's all bullshit. We had nothing to do with him. I says, but tell me the story. He says, okay. Joe Kennedy, all right? Joe Kennedy, the nicest thing you could have said about Joe Kennedy is that he hated Italians more than he hated Jews. Couldn't stand Italians. Could, <laughs> he couldn't stand Jews. So um, he wanted Jack Kennedy to become president. All right? He reaches out to Peter Lawford, his uh, son-in-law. You were friendly with that little skinny guinea, Frank Sinatra. Uh, we need a favor. What's the favor? You go to him. You're part of the Rat Pack. Tell him we need Cook County, Chicago. We need West Virginia, the unions, in order to get uh, Kennedy elected. Um, Chicago. Um, Dewey? No, no, no. Dewey was New York, the prosecutor. No. Uh, the Irish, uh, Daly. Daly. Richard Daly. Uh, Irish Catholic uh, Democrat, uh, Sam Mooney, all right? They get together. We're going to get this guy elected, all right? Now, um, he gets elected, all right? Here's the, the, here's the mentality. You came to me for a favor? Your man got elected? It was me that got him elected. Do gabisha, questa uno ma nostra. Our guy got him elected. Oh. Oh. We got a claim on you. You owe us big time. Joe Kennedy says, what's happening? He says, well, these Italians are, by the way, you fuck with these Italians. You got a girlfriend by the name of Judith Eckner Campbell. She's between you and Sam Moody. You're sharing a girlfriend. You're sending messages to him. He's sending messages to you. Just quit that shit. Where's your, your brother, Robert? Come here. Come here, Bobby. You're going to be the United States Attorney General, all right? Because you're mean and vicious like the old man. Your brother, Jack, all he wants to do is screw everybody, <laughs> all right? So you're going to get rid of these Italians because they are a pain in the ass. They're a pain in my Irish ass. Okay. He opens up the crime, uh, 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 passes a bill called the Omnibus, which is the preface to the eventual law called the uh, um, uh, RICO, all right? He has a department within the state, within the United States Department of Justice, anti, uh, anti-mafia, and, all right? It starts with Robert Kennedy. Now, in the mind of the Italians, they say, wait a minute, I spent the cloud, wait, what are you doing here? We got you elected, now you're gonna go after us, you son of a bitch, you ba 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 Kennedy bastards. I told you you never could trust an Irishman. That Irish son of a bitch, and so forth and so forth. Now, I used to go to Dallas, Texas, to buy pinball machines from an old friend of my dad by the name of Abe Sussman. Oh, and Abe was, Abe was the connection Jew in, in Dallas. So D- Dallas always answered to Chicago. Chicago, hmm. everybody, that crew in Dallas, and, well, everything west of uh, up until Vegas. Vegas was open. Jacks of Chicago. Jacks answered Chicago. to Chicago. Makes sense, yeah. yeah. So yeah. if some Jew from Chicago got himself jammed up in Dallas, they used to call Abe and say, Abe, we got one of your Jews here. Got it. Get him on an airplane. Get him the hell out of here. Yeah. All right. That was the system in Dallas, Texas. And that explains how Jack Rubenstein, Jack Ruby, was in the the Dallas Police Department because he used to buy coffee, hang around. He was low level, but he was a low level Jewish gangster from Chicago. All right. Now, it raises the whole question. What the hell was Jack Ruby doing in the Dallas Police Department and killing uh, Lee Harvey Oswald? So, where it concerns legends and myths, all right, we'll sit here from now until the cows come home because the same stories over and over, who killed Longies Wilman, uh, who killed this one, who killed that one, and so forth, who killed Marilyn Monroe, 
If you weren't there, if you weren't involved in a hit, you don't know. Jewish mob, huh? Complete different story and angle about what he had to say about the history of Jewish mob, how powerful they were before. 25% of inmates. Very interesting history of the Jewish mob that uh, Myron shared with us. Thank you very Thank much. You very it was much. nice. It was nice. And uh, I watched all your v videos and I got that phone call the other day. I said to myself, wow, I'm going to be a superstar. <laughs> I'm going to have groupies. I'm going to have women. You're who going take, to. Women who want to take selfies with me. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I you, you're no longer going to need Tinder just because of how you oh, yeah, I'm going to have to walk around with bigger than my cane's not going to no be No more swipe enough. rights. I just want I'm you to have, have no more swipe rights. I'm going to I'm gonna have to walk around with a baseball bat <laughs> to protect myself. All those women. Thank you, Patrick. I appreciate that. Nice Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you.